Is it fair to blame Alberta? Alberta serves as a metaphor for all of Canada, I think. And that's what I was looking for in trying to describe the situation at present and historically in this country concerning our treatment of the environment and our search for energy and where that's leading us. Do we want a country where in Alberta, for instance, you've simply dug up the north, the entire north, without any idea of the environmental impact of what you've just done, on the hope that maybe we can reverse it? Do we want a country where we basically carpet bomb the southern part of Alberta and certain areas of, uh, of uh, Saskatchewan, etc., with uh, coal bed methane drilling? To add to the 340,000 wells that we've already drilled into the underbelly of that province. And every indication shows that this is leading to the contamination of, of water wells, etc., in that province in a province which is already severely um, facing fairly severe water problems coming into the future. It's an arid climate in the south of Alberta. And every climate change um, prediction indicates that the desertification of southern Alberta will be a big issue in the decades to come. But our sort of mad rush to get every ounce of fuel out of that province is hastening the whole problem and causing us to not really sit back and face what we're doing and to find solutions. One of the uh, earliest ways that they came up with to extract the oil from the oil sands, uh, a plan I'd never heard of. Yeah. Well, in the 1950s, there was a guy named um, Manly Maitland and he was a geologist for the Richfield Oil Company, which had leases in the oil sands in Alberta. He also had, and he had responsibility for these leases. He happened to be in Saudi Arabia doing some research there, and he was watching a sunset one day. And uh, if you've ever been to the Middle East in the desert, or in any desert, sunsets are really magnificent things. Um, Anyway, this particular sunset <laughs> reminded him of thermonuclear energy and, uh, and of course, the atom bomb. And uh, the light went on and he thought that, hey, you know, you could use that energy if you could harness it properly to extract oil from the oil sands relatively cheaply. And his idea was that you would drill down a borehole into the oil sands below them into the sediment, maybe 1,300 feet or so. You would plant an atomic bomb at the bottom of that borehole and you'd blow it. And what it would do, it would melt the sediment into a huge cavern. The thermal heat would extract the oil from the sands, which would drip and fall into the, the cavern, and then you just pump it out. It'd be easy, you know? Um, kind of a loony idea, really, I think. Um, but it was taken very seriously at the time. And both the federal government in Canada, the provincial government in Alberta were actually very enthusiastic about it. And so was the U.S. Congress, which gave Richfield Oil permission to purchase an atomic bomb from them. Um, and they also selected the area where they were going to test this theory out. It's about a, an hour south of Fort McMurray in a place called Chard. Um, viewing it as just an empty area, even though there were Indians in the area that, uh, that could withstand a nuclear explosion. And tests showed that the actual radiation fallout would be very little, little more than what you get on a wristwatch, etc., or so they thought. Anyway, the thing went, almost went ahead, and if it weren't for the fact that oil was discovered in Prudhoe Bay in Alaska and Richfield was basically diverted to this easier method of getting oil, um, we may very well have had some nuclear blasts uh, nuke in the underbelly of, of Alberta. <laughs> as awful as that nuke plan is, mm -hmm. by the time I went through all the ramifications of using the basically water to to boil it, mm -hmm. the oil out, I thought, wow, what? Which is worse? Because the, what that does to the water up there and the land, mm -hmm. horrific. It is horrific, and, and you're quite right. I mean, I, I brought 
that whole story about you know Nateland and his bomb because it, it really reflects um, the distance we're prepared to go to, to drag the energy out and the destruction we're prepared to to uh, uh, to, to to make and to endure uh, in order to do that. But really, what's happening now is almost the same thing. You have vast lakes up there of toxic sludge um, that nobody knows what to do with. They're so big, these lakes, that you can actually apparently see them from the moon. Uh, they are certainly the biggest bodies of water in that area. They are, they are held back from the Athabasca River um, by a dam system that next to the three gorgeous dams in China is the biggest in the world. This dam system leaks and they are permitted to to put a, a, a certain amount of this toxic sludge into the river every year, tens of thousands of, of liters of this stuff. And um, nobody knows because nobody's really monitoring what the effect is on the river in its low and high levels, etc. throughout the year. And they are taking a phenomenal amount of water out of that river every year. And once you get all of these projects that they've got on the books now up and running, you could see half the flow of that river going into the oil sands. Now, this is a river that is connected directly to the entire Mackenzie River system. So it's a phenomenally important river shed for this country. The book is Stupid to the Last Drop, How Alberta is Bringing Environmental Armageddon to Canada and doesn't seem to care. I'm speaking with the author William Marsden and Stupid to the Last Drop, published by Knopf Canada.